Hi guys. So ready for today's reading. And finishing today's coffee. <clears throat> so last we saw, the last thing that happened was that um, Day had a serious attack uh, issue with his, his brain thing. So he had to go to the hospital and he seemed to have like lost consciousness a little bit, lost his like ability to kind of identify things. Um, so he had like a serious issue with his brain and that's not good. It seems to be escalating. His medicine isn't working anymore. So that's not good at all. Um, and June has been um, spending time with Andon and uh, kind of talking about the, talking and thinking about the whole um, situation between Matthias and Thomas. And so Thomas kind of did a big confession to her the other day, explaining that like, what what happened and why he did it. So now we're going to see the next part of Dave's story. So we're starting on page 68. <clears throat> Day. They keep me at the hospital overnight before they release me to my apartment. By now the news is out. Bystanders had seen me wheeled out, had spread the word to other folks. And soon the wildfire was unstoppable when the rumor's been uttered in every corner of the city. I see the news cycle try to hide it twice already. I was in the hospital for a standard checkup. I was in the hospital to visit my brother. All sorts of gaudy stories, but no one's buying it. I spend all day enjoying the luxury of a non-hospital bed, watching light, slushy snow falling outside our window, while Eden camps out on the bed by my feet and plays with a robotics kit we'd gotten from the Republic as a gift. He's piecing together some sort of robot now. He matches up a magnetic light cube, a palm-sized box with mini screens on its side, with several arm, leg, and wing cubes to create what's essentially a little flying jumbotron man. He smiles in delight at it, then breaks the cubes apart and rearranges them into a pair of walking legs that display jumbotron video feeds wherever they step down. I smile too, momentarily content that he's content. If there's one good thing about the Republic, it's that they indulge Eden's love for building stuff. Every other week, we seem to get some new contraption that I've only ever seen upper-class kids own. I wonder if June's the one who put in this special request for Eden, knowing what she does. Or maybe Andon just feels guilty for all the stuff his father put us through. I wonder if she's heard the news yet. She must have. Careful, I said as Eden climbs up onto my bed and leans over to stand his new creation up the edge of the window. His hands fumble around, feeling for the windowsill and the glass pane. If you fall and break something, we'll have to head back to the hospital. And I am not going to be happy about that. You're thinking about her again, aren't you? Eden fires smoothly back. His blind eyes stay squinted at the blocks, bar standing barely an inch from his face. <clears throat> he always changed your voice. I blink at him in surprise. What? He looks in my direction and raises an eyebrow at me, and the expression looks comical on his childish, childlike face. Oh, come on. It's so obvious. What's this June girl to you anyway? The whole country gossips about you two, and when she asked to come to, you to come to Denver, you couldn't pack us up fast enough. You told me to call her in case the Republic ever comes to take me away. You're going to have to spill sooner or later, yeah? You're always talking about her. I don't talk about her all the time. Uh-huh, right. I'm glad Eden can't see my expression. I've yet to talk with him about June and her connection to the rest of our family. Another good reason to stay away from her. She's a friend, I finally reply. Do you like her? My eyes go back to studying the rainy scene outside our window. Yeah. Eden waits for me to say more, but when I remain silent, he shrugs and goes back to his robot. Fine, he mutters. Tell me whenever. As if on cue, my earpiece blares out a second of soft static, warning me of an incoming call. I accept it. A moment later, June's whispered voice echoes in my ear. She doesn't say anything about my illness. She just suggests, can we talk? I knew it'd only be a matter of time before I heard from her. I watch Eden playing for a second longer. We gotta do it somewhere else, I whisper back. My brother glances at me, momentarily curious in my words. I don't want to ruin my first day of the hospital by breaking my depressed pro depressing prognosis to an 11-year-old. 
How about a walk then? I glance out the window. It's dinner time, and the cafes down the streets ground level are crowded with patrons, almost all of them huddled under hats, caps, umbrellas, and hoods, keeping to themselves in this twilight slush. Might be a good time to walk around without any attracting too much attention. How about this? Come on over and we'll head out from here. Great, June replies. She hangs up. Ten minutes later, my doorbell rings and startled Eden to his feet. The new cube robot he, he built falls from my bed. <clears throat> Three of its limbs snapping off. Eden turns his eyes in my direction. Who's there? He asks. Don't worry, kid, I reply, walking over to the door. It's June. Eden's shoulders relax at my words. A bright grin lights up his face, and he hops off the edge of the bed, leaving his block robot by the window. He, he feels his way toward the other end of the bed. Well, he demands, aren't you going to let her in? It seems like during the time I'd spent living on the streets, I'd been missing out on seeing Eden blossom. A quiet kid turned stubborn and headstrong. Can't imagine how he inherited that. I sigh. I hate keeping things from him, but how do I explain this one? I told him over the past year who June is. A Republic girl who decided to help us out. A girl who's now training to be the country's future princeps. I haven't yet figured out how to tell him the rest. So I just don't say anything about it at all. June doesn't smile when I open the door. She glances at Eden, then back at me. Is that your brother? She says quietly. I nod. You haven't met him yet, have you? I turn around and call out to him. Eden, manners. Eden waves from the bed. Hi, he calls out. I step aside so that June can come in. She makes her way over to where Eden is, sits down next to him with a smile, and takes his small hand in hers. She shakes it twice. Pleased to meet you, Eden, she says. Her voice gentle. I lean against the door to watch the exchange. How are you doing? Eden shrugs. Pretty good, I guess, he replies. Doctors say my eyes have stabilized. I'm taking 10 different pills every day. He tilts his head. But I think that I've been getting stronger. He buffs out his chest a little then strikes a mock pose by flexing his arms. His eyes are unfocused and pointing slightly to the left of June's face. How do I look? June laughs. I have to say, you look better than most people I see. I've heard a lot about you. I hear a lot about you. I, I hear about you a lot too, Eden replies in a rush. Mostly from Daniel. He thinks you're really hot. Okay, that's enough. I clear my throat loud enough for him to hear. Then shoot him a cranky look, even though he's blind as a rock. Let's set out. Have you eaten yet? She asks as we head toward the door. I was supposed to be shadowing Andon with the other princeps selects, but he's been called to the armor barracks for a quick briefing. Something about food poisoning among the soldiers. So I had a couple of free hours. A faint blush touches her cheeks as she says this. I thought maybe we could grab a bite? I raise an eyebrow. Then I lean in toward her so that my cheek brushes against hers. To my excitement, I feel, a sh feel her shiver at my touch. Why, June? I tease in a low, soft voice, smiling yesteryear. Are you asking me out on a date? June's blush deepens, but its warmth doesn't touch her eyes. My moment of mischief ends. I clear my throat, then look over my shoulder at Eden. I'll bring back some food for you. Don't go out on your own. Do to what Lucy tells you to do. Eden nods, already engrossed with the block robot again. Minutes later, we, we head out into the apartment complex, into the thick thickening gr drizzle. <laughs> I keep my head down and my face hidden under the shadow of a soldier cap. My neck's protected beneath my thick red scarf, and my hands are shoved deep into the pockets of my military coat. It's strange how much I've gotten used to Republic clothing. June pulls her coat's collar high, and her breath billows out around her in clouds of steam. The slush has picked up some, sending fresh ice and water into my face and tickling my eyelashes. Bold red banners still hang from the windows of most high-rises, and the jumbotrons have red and black symbols in the corner of their broadcasts in honor of Andon's birthday. Others along the street rush past in a blur of motion. We walk in comfortable silence, savoring the simple nearness of each other. It's kind of weird, actually. Today is one of my better days, and I don't have a lot of trouble keeping up with June. Today, it doesn't feel like I only have a couple of months to live. Maybe the new medicines they gave me aren't going to work this time. We don't say a word until June finally stops us at a small steaming cafe, several blocks from my apartment. Right away, I can see why she chose it. It's mostly empty, a tiny little spot on the first floor of a towering high-rise, washed wet with slush, and not very well lit. Even though it's open to the air, like many other cafes in the area, it has a few dark nooks that are nice for us to sit in. They're nice for us to sit at, and its only lights come from glowing cube-shaped lanterns on each of the tables. A hostess ush ushers us inside. 
seating us at June's request in one of the shadowy corners. Flat plates of scented water sit scattered throughout the cafe. I shiver, even though our spot is pretty warm from our heat lantern. What are we doing here again? A strange fog washes over me, then clears. We're here for dinner, that's what we're doing. I shake my head. I recall the brief struggle I'd had a few days ago when I couldn't remember Lucy's name. A frightening thought emerges. Maybe this is a new symptom, or maybe I'm just being paranoid. After we place our orders, June, June speaks up. The gold flecks in her eyes shine in the lantern's orange glow. Why didn't you tell me, she whispers. I hold my hands against the lantern, savoring the heat. What good would it have done? June furrows her eyebrows, and only then do I notice that her eyes look kind of swollen, like she's been crying. She shakes her head at me. The rumors are all over the place, she continues in a voice I can barely hear. Witnesses say they saw you being carried out of your apartment on a stretcher 34 hours ago. One of them apparently overheard a medic discussing your condition. I sigh and put my hands up in defeat. You know what? If this is all somehow causing riots in the street and more trouble for Andon, then I'm sorry. I was told to keep it a secret, and I did, as well as I could. I'm sure our glorious elector will figure out a way to calm the folks down. June bites her lip once. There must be some solution, Day. Have your doctors? They are already trying everything. I wince as a painful spasm runs through the back of my head, as if on cue. I've been through three rounds of experiments. Slow and painful progress so far. I explained to June what the doctors had told me. The unusual infection in my hippocampus. The medication that's been weakening me, sucking the strength out of my body. Believe me, they're running through solutions. How long do you have? She whispers. I stay silent, pretending to be fascinated by the lanterns. I don't know if I have the heart to say it. June leans closer until her shoulder bumps softly against mine. How long do you have? She repeats. Please. I hope you still care about me enough to tell me. I gaze back at her, slowly fail falling, as I always seem to do, back under her pole. Don't make me do this, please. I don't want to say it out loud to her. It might mean that it's actually true. But she looks so sad and fearful that I can't keep it in. I let out my breath, then run a hand through my hair and lower my head. They said a month, I whispered. Maybe two. They said I should get my priorities in order. June closes her eyes. I think I see her sway slightly in her seat. Two months, she murmurs vacantly. The agony on her face reminds me exactly why I didn't let, want to let her know. After another long silence between us, June snaps out of her daze and reaches to pull something out of her pocket. She comes back with something small and metallic in her palm. I have a meaning to give this to you, she says. I stare blankly at it. It's a paperclip ring. Thin lines of wire are pulled into an elegant series of swirls and closed into a circle just like the one I'd once made for her. My eyes widen and dart up to hers. She doesn't say anything. Instead, she looks down and helps me push it onto my right hand's ring finger. I had a little time, she finally mutters. I run a hand across the ring in wonder. My heartstrings pull taut. A dozen emotions run through me. I'm sorry, I stammer out after a while, trying to put a more hopeful spin on everything. That's all I can say after this gift from her. I think there's still a chance. There Trying out some more treatment soon. You once told me why you chose Day as your street name, she says firmly. She moves her hand so that it's over mine, hiding the paperclip ring from view. The warmth of her skin against mine makes my breath short. Every morning, everything's possible again, right? A river of tingles runs up my spine. I want to take her face in my hands again, kiss her cheeks, and study her dark, sad eyes, and tell her I'll be okay. But that would be just another lie. Half of my heart is breaking at the pain on her face. The other half, I realize guiltily, is swelling with happiness to know that she still cares. There's love in her tragic words, in the folds of that thin metal ring, isn't there? Finally, I take a deep breath. Sometimes the sun sets earlier. Days don't last forever, you know? But I'll fight as hard as I can. I can promise you that. June's eyes soften. soften. You don't have to do this alone. Why should you have to bear it? I mutter back. I just thought it would be easier this way. Easier for whom, June snaps. You, me, the public? You would rather just pass away silently one day without ever breathing another word to me? Yes, I would, I finally find myself snapping back. If I told you that night, would you have agreed to become a princess elect? Whatever words sat on the tip of June's tongue go unspoken. She pauses at that, then swallows. No, 
she admits. I wouldn't have had the heart to do it. I would have waited. Exactly. I take a deep breath. You think I wanted to whine to you about my health in that moment? To stand in the way of you in the position of a lifetime? That was my choice to make, June says through clenched teeth. And I wanted you to make it without me in the way. June shakes her head and her shoulders droop, droop slightly. You really think I care so little about you? Our food arrives then, steaming bowls of soup, plates of dinner rolls, and a neatly wrapped package of food for Eden. And I lapse gratefully into the silence. It would have been easier for me, I add to myself. I'd rather step away than be reminded every day that I only have a few months left to be with you. I'm ashamed to say this out loud, though. When June looks expectantly at me for an answer, I just shake my head and shrug. And that's when we hear it. An alarm wails out across the city. It's deafening. We both freeze and look up at the speakers lining all the street's buildings. I've never heard a siren like this in my entire life. An endless and ear-splitting scream that drenches the air, drowning out anything in its path. The jumbotrons have gone dark. I shoot June a bewildered look. What the hell is that? But June's no longer looking at me. Her eyes are fixed on the speakers, blaring out the alarm across the entire street, and her expression is stricken with horror. Together, we watch the jumbotrons flare back to life. This time, each screen is blood red, and each has two gold words etched in bold across its display. Seek cover. What does it mean? I shout. June grabs my hand and starts to run. It means that an airstrike's coming. The armor is under attack. Perfect timing for, you know, a bomb. <laughs> June. Eden. It's the first word out of Day's mouth. The Jumbotrons continue broadcasting their ominous scarlet notice as the alarm echoes through across the city, deafening me with its rhythmic roar and blotting out all the other sounds of the city. Along the street, others are peeking out of windows and pouring out from building entrances, as bewildered as we are over the unusual alarm. Soldiers are flooding into formation on the street, shouting into their earpieces as they see the approaching enemy. I run right beside him, thoughts and numbers racing through my mind as we go. Four seconds, 12 seconds, 15 seconds a block, which means 75 seconds until we reach Day's apartment if we keep up our pace. Is there a faster route? And Ollie, I need to get him out of my apartment and to my side. A strange focus grips me, just like it had the moment I first freed Day from Batal Hall all those months ago. Like the moment Day climbed, in, in, climbed the Capitol Tower to address the people, and I led soldiers off his trail. I may turn into a silent, uncomfortable observer in the Senate chamber, but out here on the streets, in the midst of the chaos, I can think. I can act. I remember reading about and rehearsing for this particular alarm back in high school, although Los Angeles is so far away from the colonies that even those practice drills were rare. The, alarms, the alarm was on, to be used only if enemy forces attacked our city, if they were right at the city's borders and barging their way in. I don't know what the process is like in Denver, but I imagine it can't be much that different. We are to evacuate immediately, then seek out the closest assigned underground bunker and board subways that will shut us to a safer city. After I entered college and officially became a soldier, the drill changed for me. Soldiers are to report immediately to a location their commanding officers give them over their earpieces. We must be ready for war at a moment's notice. But I've never heard the alarm used for a real attack on a Republic city because there hasn't been one yet. Most attacks were thwarted before they could reach us until now. And as I run alongside Day, I know exactly what must be going through his mind. It triggers a familiar guilt in my stomach. Day has never heard the alarm before, nor has he ever gone through a drill for it. This is because he's from a poor sector. I was never sure before, and I admit that I never thought about much about it. But seeing Day's confused expression makes it all very clear. The underground bunkers are only for the upper class, the gem sectors. The poor are left to fend for themselves. Over her, overhead, an engine screams by, a Republic jet, then several more. Shouts rise up and mix with the alarm. I brace myself for a call from Andon at any moment. Then, far off from the horizon, I see the first orange glows light up the, along the armor. The Republic is launching a counterattack from the walls. This is really happening, but it shouldn't be. The colonies had given us, had given us time, however little, to hand over an antidote to, the, antidote to them. And since that ultimatum, only four days have passed. My anger flares. Do they want to catch us off guard in such an extreme way? I grab Day's hand and pick up my pace. 
Can you call Eden? I shout. Yeah. Jay gasps out. Immediately, I can tell that he doesn't have the stamina he used to have. His breathing is slightly labored. His steps slightly slower. A lump lodges in my throat. Somehow, this is the first evidence of his fading health that hits home, and my heart clenches. Behind us, another explosion reverberates across the, the night air. I tighten my hold of his hand. Tell Eden to be ready at your complex's entrance, I shout. I know where we can go. An urgent voice comes up in my earpiece. It's Andon. Where are you? He says. He says. A shiver as I detect a faint hint of fear in his words. Another thing I rarely hear. I'm at the Capitol Tower. I'll send a jeep to pick you up. Send a jeep to Dave's apartment. I'll be there in a minute. And Ollie, my dog. I'll have him sent to the bunkers immediately, Andon says. Be careful. Then a click sounds out, and I hear static for a second before my earpiece goes dark. Beside me, Day repeats my instructions for Eden over his own mic. By the time we reach the apartment complex, Republic jets are screaming by every other second, painting dozens of trails into the evening sky. Crowds of people have already started gathering outside the complex and are being guided in various directions by city patrols. A jolt of fear seizes me when I realize that some of the jets on the horizon are not Republic jets at all, but unfamiliar enemy ones. If they're this close, then they must have gotten past our long-range missiles. Two large black dots hover at the end of the sky. Colony's airships. Day sees Eden before I do. He's a small, golden-haired figure clutching the railings by his apartment complex's entrance, squinting in vain at the sea of people around him. Their caretaker stands beside, behind him with both her hands firmly on his shoulders. Eden, Day calls out. The boy jerks his head in our direction. Day hops up to the steps and scoops him into his arms, then turns back to me. Where do we go? He shouts. The Elector's sending a jeep for us, I reply in his ear, so that the others don't hear. Already a few people are casting us glances of recognition, even as they stream past in a haze of panic. I pull my coat collars as high up as I can go, then bow my head. Come on, I mutter to myself. June, Day says. I meet his eyes. What's going to happen to the other sectors? There's a question I've been dreading. What will happen to the poor sectors? I hesitate. And in that brief moment of silence, Day realizes the answer. His lips tighten into a thin line. A deep rage rises in his eyes. The jeep's arrival saves me from answering right away. It screeches to a stop several feet from where the others have crowded around. Inside, I see Annan wave once at me from the passenger side. Let's go, I urge Day. We make our way down the steps as a soldier opens the door for us. Day helps Eden and their caretaker inside first. And then when we're both buckled up, we climb in. The jeep takes off at breakneck speed as more Republic jets fly by overhead. Off in the distance, another bright orange mushroom cloud mushrooms up from the armor. Is it me? Or did that seem like a closer hit than before? Perhaps closer by a good hundred feet, given the size of the explosion. Glad to see you all safe, Andon says without turning around. He mutters a quick greeting at each of us, then mumbles a command to the driver, who makes a sharp turn around, around the next block. Eden lets out a startled yelp. The caretaker squeezes his shoulders and tries to soothe him. Why take a slower route? Annan says as we veer down the narrow street. The ground shakes from another far-off impact. Apologies, Elector, the driver back, calls back. Words that several explosions have gone off inside the armor. Our fastest route's not safe. They bombed a few jeeps on the other side of Denver. Any injuries? Not too many, luckily. A couple jeeps overturned, several prisoners escaped, and one soldier's dead. Which prisoners? We're still confirming. A nas nasty premonition hits me. When I'd gone to see Thomas, there had been a rotation of guards standing in front of Commander Jameson's cell. When I left, the guards were different. And it makes a frustrated sound, then turns to glance back at us. We're headed to an underground hole called Sub Subterrain 1. Should you need to enter or leave the hold, my guards will scan your thumbs at its gateway. You heard our driver. It's not safe to head out on your own. Understand? The driver, hold on, sorry. The driver presses a hand to his ear, blanches, and looks at Andon. Sir, we have confirmation of the escape prisoners. There were three. He hesitates, then swallows. Captain Thomas Bryant, Lieutenant Patrick Murray, Commander Natasha Jameson. My words lurch. I knew it. Just yesterday, I'd seen Commander Jameson securely behind bars and talked to Thomas while he was withering away in prison. They couldn't have gone far, I tell myself. Andon, I whisper, forcing my senses straight. Yesterday, when I went to see Thomas, there had been a different rotation of guards. Were those soldiers supposed to be there? 
Day and I exchange a quick look. And for an instant, I feel as if the entire world is playing us for fools, weaving our lives into one cruel joke. Find the prisoners, Andon snaps into his mic. His own face has turned white. Shoot them on sight. He glances back at me when he continues talking. And get me the guards that were on duty. Now. I cringe as yet another explosion makes the ground tremble. They couldn't have gotten far. They'll be captured and shot by the end of the day. I repeat these words to myself over and over. No, something else is at work here. My mind flits through the possibilities. It's no coincidence that the Commander Jameson managed to escape, and that the colony's attack happened on the same day she was being transferred. There must be other traitors in the Republic's ranks, soldiers that Andon hasn't rooted out yet. Commander Jameson may have been passing information to the colonies through them. After all, the colonies have somehow knew when our armor soldiers would rotate shifts. And particularly that today, we had fewer armor soldiers stationed than usual due to the food poisoning. They knew to strike at our weakest moment. If that's the case, then the colonies may have been planning an attack for months, maybe even before the plague outbreak. And Thomas, was he in on the whole thing? Unless he was trying to warn me. That's why he asked for me yesterday. For his final request, but also in the hopes that I would notice something off about the guards? My heartbeat quickens. But why wouldn't he just shout a warning? What happens next? I ask Nemli. Andon leans his head back against the seat. He's probably thinking through a similar list of possibilities about the, pr the escaped prisoners, but he doesn't say it out loud. Our jets are all engaged right outside Denver. The armor should, be help should hold for a good while, and there's a strong chance more colonies' forces are on their way. We're going to need help. Other nearby cities have been alerted and are sending their troops for reinforcement, but... And it pauses to look over his shoulder at me. It might not be enough. While we keep funneling civilians underground, June, you and I are going to have a private talk right away. Where are you evacuating the poor to, Elector? Day pops up, pipes up quietly. And turns in his seat again. He meets Day's hostile blue eyes with, his, at, with as level a look as he can manage. I notice that he avoids looking at Eden. I have troops on their way to the outer sectors, he says. They'll find shelter for the civilians and defend them until I give a command otherwise. No underground bunkers for them, I guess, Day replies coldly. I'm sorry, and lets out a long breath. The bunkers were built a long time ago, before my father even became elector. We're working on adding more. Day leans forward and narrows his eyes. His right hand grips Eden's tightly. Then split the bunkers up between the sectors, half poor, half rich. The upper class should risk their necks out in the open as much as the lower class. No, in instance firmly, even though I hear the regret in his words. He makes the point, makes the mistake of arguing this point with Day, and I can't stop him. If we were to do that, the logistics would be a nightmare. The outer sectors don't have the same evacuation routes. If explosions hit the city, hundreds of thousands more people would be vulnerable to the open because we wouldn't be able to organize everyone in time. We evacuate the gem sectors first. Then we can do it, Day shouts. I don't care about your damn logistics. Andon's face hardens. You will not talk to me, talk back to me like that. He snaps. There's steel in his voice, and I recognize from that I recognize from Commander Jameson's trial. I'm your elector, and I put you there. Day snaps back. Fine. You want to talk logically? I'm game. If you don't make a bigger effort to protect the poor right now, I can practically guarantee that you'll have a full-on riot on your hands. Do you really want that while the colonies are attacking? Like you said, you're the elector, but you won't be if the rest of the country's poor hears about how you're handling this. And even I might not be able to stop them from starting a revolution. They already think the Republic's trying to kill me off. How long do you think the Republic can hold up against a war from both the outside and the inside? And in spacing forward again. This conversation's over. As always, his voice is dangerously quiet, but we can hear every single word. Day lets out a curse and slumps back in his seat. I exchange a glance with him, then shake my head. Day has a point, of course, and so does Andon. The problem is that we don't have time for all this nonsense. After a moment of silence, I lean forward in my seat, clear my throat, and try an alternative. Day mutters something under his breath. Oh, wait, I let. We should evacuate the poor into the wealthy sectors, I say. They'll still be above ground, but the wealthy sectors sit in the heart of Denver, not along the armor where the fighting is happening. It's a flawed plan, but the poor will also see that we're making a concerted effort to protect them. Then, as the people in the bunkers are gradually evacuated to L.A. via underground subways, 
we'll have the time and space to start filtering everyone else underground as well. Day mutters something under his breath, but at the same time, he grunts in reluctant approval. He shoots me a grateful look. Sounds like a better plan to me. At least the people have something. A second later, I figure out what he'd mutter. It was that he'd mutter. You'd make a better elector than this fool. Andon's quiet for a moment as he considers the words, considers my words. Then he nods in agreement and presses a hand against his ear. Commander Green, he says, then launches into a series of orders. I meet Day's eyes. He still looks upset, but at least his eyes aren't burning in anger like they were a second ago. He turns his attention back on Lucy, who is an armed wrapped protectively around Eden. He's curled up in the corner of the jeep seat with his legs tucked up and his arms wrapped around them. He squints at the scene blurring by, but I'm not sure how much of it he can actually make out. I reach across Day and touch Eden's shoulder. He tenses up immediately. It's okay. It's June, I say. Don't worry. We're going to be fine. Do you hear? Why do the colonies break through? Eden asks, turning his wide, purple-toned eyes on me and Day. I swallow hard. Neither of us answers him. Finally, after he repeats his question, Day hugs him closer and whispers something in his ear. Eden settles down against the bro his brother's shoulder. He still looks unhappy and scared, but the terror is at least tempered, and we manage to finish the rest of the ride without saying another word. It feels like an eternity. In actuality, the trip takes a mere two minutes and 12 seconds. But we finally arrive at a nondescript building near the heart of the, uh, downtown Denver, a 30-story high-rise covered with crisscrossing support beams on all four of its sides. Dozens of city patrols are mixed in with the crowds of civilians, organizing them into groups at the entrance. Our driver pulls a jeep up to the side of the building, where patrols let us through a door of, of a makeshift fence. Through the window, I see soldiers click their heels together in sharp salutes as we pass by. One of them is holding Ollie on a leash. I slump in, the re in relief at the sight of him. When the jeep halts, two of them promptly open the doors for us. Annan steps out. Immediately, he's surrounded by four patrol captains, all feverishly updating him on how the evacuation is going. My dog pulls his soldier frantically to my side. I thank the soldier, take over the leash, and rub Ollie's head. He's panting in distress. This way, Mr. Paris, the soldier who opens my door says. Day follows behind me in a tense silence, his hand still clutched tightly around Eden's. Lucy comes out last. I look over my shoulder to where Andon's now deep in conversation with his captains. He pauses to exchange a quick look with me. His eyes dart to Eden. I know that he thought he must be, that I know that the thought he has must be the same thought running through Day's mind. Keep Eden safe. I nod, signaling to him that I understand. And then we move past a crowd of waiting evacuees and I lose sight of him. Instead of dealing with a lineup of civilians at the entrance, soldiers escort us through a separate entrance and down a winding set of stairs until we reach a dimly lit hallway that ends in a set of wide steel double doors. The guards standing at the entrance shift their stance where they recognize me. This way, Mr. Paris, they say. One of them stiffens at the sight of Day. And looks quickly away when Day meets his stare. The doors swing open for us. We're greeted by a blast of warm, humid air and a scene of orderly chaos. The room we've stepped into seems like an enormous warehouse, half the size of a trial stadium, three dozen fluorescents, and six rows of steam be steel beams lining the ceiling with a lone jumbotron on the left with wall blasting instructions to the upper class evacuees who mill all around us. Amongst them are a handful of poor sector people, 14 of them to be exact, who must have been the housekeepers and janitors of some of the gem sector's homes. To my disappointment, I see soldiers separating them out into a different line. Several upper class people cast them sympathetic looks while others glare in disdain. Day sees them too. Guess we're all created equal, he mutters. I say nothing. A few smaller rooms line the right wall. At the far end of the room, the end of, the end of a parked subway train rests inside a tunnel, and crowds of both soldiers and civilians have gather, gathered along both of its platforms. The soldiers are attempting to organize the crowds of bewildered, frightened people into the, into the subway. Where it will take them, I can only guess. Beside me, Beside me, Day watches the scene with silent, simmering eyes. His hand stays clamped on Eden. I wonder whether he's taking note of the aristocratic clothing that most of these evacuees are wearing. Apologies for the mess, a guard says to me as she escorts us toward one of the smaller rooms. She taps the edge of her cap politely. We're in the early stages of evacuation, and as you can see, the first wave is still in progress. We can have you, as well as Day and his family, on the first wave as well, if you don't mind resting for a moment in a private suite. 
Mariana and Serge might already be waiting in rooms of their own. Thank you, I reply. We walk past several doors. We walk past several doors, their long rectangular windows revealing empty blank rooms with portraits of Andin hanging on their walls. A couple look as if they've been reserved for high ranking officials, while others appear to be holding people who must have caused trouble. Detainees with sullen faces flanked by pairs of soldiers. One room that we pass by holds several people surrounded by guards. Is this room? It is this room that makes me want to pause. I recognize one of the people in there. Is it really her? Wait, I call out, stepping closer to the window. No doubt about it. I see a young girl with wide eyes and a blunt, messy bob of a haircut sitting in a chair beside a gray-eyed boy and three others who look more ragged than I recall. I glance at her soldier. What are they doing in there? Day follows my lead. When he sees what I see, he sucks in a sharp breath. Get us in there, he whispers to me. His voice takes on desperate urgency. Please. These are prisoners, Mrs. Harris, the soldier replies, puzzled by her interest. I don't recommend. I tighten my lips. I want to see them, I interrupt. The soldier hesitates, glances around the room, and then nods reluctantly. Of course, she replies. She steps forward and the door opens. She steps toward the door and opens it, then ushers us in. Lucy stays right outside with her hand tightly gripping Eden's. The door closes behind us. I find my felt myself staring straight at Tess and a handful of patriots. You guys are right. All right, we'll do one more. Day. Well, damn. The last time I saw Tess, she was standing in the middle of an alley near where we were supposed to assassinate Andon. Her fist clenched and her face in a face a broken picture. She looks different now. Calmer. Older. She's also gotten a good bit taller, and her once round baby face has leaned out. Weird to see. She and the others are all shackled to chairs. The sight doesn't help any help my mood. I recognize one of her companions immediately. Pascal, the dark-skinned runner with a head of short curls and those ridiculously pale gray eyes. He hasn't changed much, although now that I'm close enough, I can see traces of a scar across his nose another one near his right temple. He flashes me a brilliant white grin that drips sarcasm. That you, Day? He says, giving me a flirtatious wink. Still as gorgeous as you've always been. Her public uniforms suit you. His words sting. I turn my glare to the soldier standing guard over them. Why the hell are they prisoners? One of them tilts his nose up at me. Based on all the gaudy decorations on his uniform, he must be the captain of this group or something. They're former patriots, he says emphasizing his last word as if he's trying to make a jab at me. We caught them along the edge of the armor, for they were attempting to disable our military equipment and aid the colonies. Pascal shifts indignantly in the chair. Bullshit, you blinder boy, he snaps. We were camped out alongside the armor because we were trying to help your sorry soldiers out. Maybe we shouldn't have bothered. Tess watches me with a wary look that she's never used with me before. Her arms look small and thin with those giant shackles clamped around her wrists. I clench my teeth. My gaze falls to the guns at the soldier's belts. No sudden moves, I remind myself. Not around these trigger-happy trots. From the corner of my eye, I notice that, the that one of the others is bleeding from the shoulder. Let them go, I tell the soldiers. They're not the enemy. The soldier glares at me with cold contempt. Absolutely not. Our orders were to detain them until such time. Beside me, June lifts her chin. Orders from whom? The soldier's bravado wavers a little. Mr. Paris, my orders came directly from the or lector, the glorious elector himself. His cheeks flush when he sees June narrow her eyes, and then he starts blabbing something about their tour of duty around the armor and how intense the battle's been. I step closer to Tess and stoop down until we're at the same eye level. The guards shift their guns, but June snaps a warning at them to stop. You came back, they whispered to Tess. Even though Tess still looks wary, something softens in her eyes. Yes. Why? Tess hesitates. She looks over at Pascal, who turns his startling gray eyes fully on me. We came back, he replies, because Tess heard you calling for us. It heard me. All those radio transmissions I'd been sending out for months and months hadn't ended up lost somewhere in the dark. Somehow they'd heard me. Tess swallows hard before she works up enough courage to speak. Frankie first caught you on the airwaves a few months ago, she says. 
nodding toward a curly haired girl tied up in one of the chairs. She said you were trying to contact us. Tess lowers her eyes. I didn't want to answer, but then I heard about your illness and so the news has definitely gotten around. Hey now, Pascal interrupts when he catches my expression. We didn't come back to the Republic just because we felt sorry for you. We've been listening to the news coming from both you and the colonies. Heard about the threat of war. And you decided to come to our aid? June pipes up. Her eyes are suspicious. Why so generous all of a sudden? Pascal's sarcastic grin fades away. He regards June with a tilt of his head. You're June of Paris, aren't you? The captain starts to tell him to greet June as a, in a more formal way, but June just nods. So you're the one who sabotaged our plans and split up our crew. Pascal shrugs. No hard feelings. Not that, you know, I was a big fan of Razor or anything. Why are you back in the country? June repeats. Okay, fine. We got kicked out of Canada. Pascal takes a deep breath. We were hiding out there after everything fell apart during the... He pauses to glance at the soldiers around us. The, uh, you know, our play day with Andon. But then the Canadians figured out that we weren't supposed to be in their country and we had to flee back south. A lot of us scattered to the winds. I don't know where half our original group is now. Chances are that some of them are still in Canada. When the news about day broke, little Tess here asked if we could leave, if she could leave us and head back to Denver on her own. I didn't want her to, well, die, so we all came along. Pascal looks down for a moment. He doesn't stop talking, but I can tell that he's just blabbing at this point, trying to give us any reason but their main one. With the colonies invading, I thought that if we tried helping out your war effort, then maybe we could get a pardon and permission to stay in the country. But I know your elector probably isn't our biggest. What is all this? All of us turn around at the voice, right as the soldiers in the room snap into salutes. I get up from my crouch to see Andon standing in the doorway with a group of bodyguards behind him, his eyes dark and ominous, his stare fixed first on June and me and then on the Patriots. Even though it hasn't been that long since we left him behind to talk with his generals, he has a fine layer of dust on his shoulders, uh, of the shoulders on his uniform and his face looks bleak. The captain who'd been talking to us earlier now clears his throat nervously. My apologies, Elector, but we detained these criminals near the armor. At that, June crosses her arms. And then I'm guessing you weren't the one who approved this Elector, she says to Andon. There's an edge on her inner voice that tells me she and Andon aren't on the best ter she and Andon aren't on the best terms right now. Andon regards the scene. Our argument from the car ride over is probably still stewing in his mind, but he doesn't bother looking in my direction. Well, good. Maybe I've given him something to think about. Finally, he knocks to the captain. Who are they? Former Patriots, sir. I see. Who ordered this? The captain turns bright red. Well, Elector, he replies, trying to sound official. My commanding officer. But Andon has already turned his attention away from the lying captain and starts to leave the room. Take those shackles off them, he says without turning back around. Keep them in here for now and then evacuate them with the final group. Watch them carefully. He motions for us to follow him. Ms. Paris, Mr. Wing, if you please. I look back one more time at Tess, who's watching the shoulder soldiers unclick, unclick the shackles from her wrists. Then I head out with June. Eden rushes over to me, nearly colliding with me in his hurry, and I take his hand back in mine. Annan stops us before a group of Republic soldiers. I frown at the sight. Four of the soldiers are kneeling on the ground with their hands on their heads. Their eyes stay downcast. One weeps silently. The remaining soldiers in the group have their guns pointed at the kneeling soldiers. The soldier in charge just addresses Andon. These are the guards who were in charge of Commander Jameson and Captain Bryant. We found a suspicious communication between one of them and the colonies. No wonder he brought us out here to see the faces of our potential traitors. I look back at the captured guards. The crying one looks up at Andon with pleading eyes. Please, Elector, he begs. I had nothing to do with their escape. I, I don't know how it happened. I... His words cut off as a gun barrel cuffs him in the head. Andon's face, normally thoughtful and reserved, has turned ice cold. I look from the kneeling soldiers back at him. He's silent for a moment. Then he nods at his men. Interrogate them. If they don't cooperate, shoot them. Spread the word to the rest of the troops. Let it be a lesson to any other traitors within our ranks. Let them know we will root them out. The soldiers with guns click their heels. Yes, sir. They haul the accused traitors to their feet. A sick feeling hits my stomach. But Andon doesn't take back his words. Instead, he looks on as the soldiers are dragged, shouting and pleading out of the bunker. June looks stricken. Her eyes follow the prisoners. 
and it turns on us with a grave expression. The colonies have helped. A dull thud echoes from somewhere above us, and the ground and ceiling trembles in response. June peers closer to Andon, as if analyzing him. What kind of help? I saw their squadrons in the air, right above the armor. They're not all colonies' jets. Some of them have African stars painted on the side. My generals tell me the colonies are confident enough to have parked an airship and a squadron of jets less than a half a mile from our armor, setting up makeshift airfields as they go. They're ramping up for another assault. My hand tightens around Eden's. He squints at the swarms of evacuees crowded near the subway, but he probably can't see anything more than a mass of moving blurs. I wish I could take the frightened look off his face. How long is Denver going to hold? I ask. I don't know, Anna replies grimly. The armor is strong, but we can't fight a superpower for long. So what do we do now? June says. If we can't hold them off for long, then are we just going to lose this war? Anna shakes his head. We need help too. I'm going to see, I'm going to get us an audience with the United Nations or with Antarctica. See whether they're willing to step up to the plate. That might buy, buy us enough time for. He glances at my brother, quiet and calm beside me. A stab of guilt and rage hits me. I narrow my eyes at Andon. My hand clamps tighter on my brother's arm. Eden shouldn't be in the middle of this. I shouldn't have to choose between losing my brother and losing this damn country. Hopefully it won't come to that, I say. As he and June launch into an in-depth conversation about Antarctica, I look back in the room where Tess and the Patriots are being held. Through the window, I can see Tess tending carefully to the girl with the bleeding shoulder, while the soldiers look on with uneasy expressions. Don't know why all those trained killers should be scared of a little girl armed with a handful of bandages and rubbing alcohol. I shiver as I think of the way Andon ordered those accused soldiers out of the bunker and killed. Pascal looks frustrated, and for a moment he meets my stare through the glass. Even though he doesn't move his mouth, I can tell what he's thinking. He knows that trapping the Patriots inside a room during the middle of a battle, while civilians and soldiers alike are getting killed above ground, is a total gaudy waste. Elector, I suddenly say, turning back to face Andon in June. He pauses to stare at me. Let them out of this bunker. When Andon stays silent, compelling, compelling me to go on, I add, they can help your effort up there. I bet they can play the guerrilla game better than any of your soldiers. And since you won't be evacuating the poor sectors for a while, you might need all the help you can get. June doesn't say anything about my little jab, but Andon folds his arms across his chest. Day, I pardoned the Patriots as part of our original deal, but I haven't forgotten about my difficult history with them. While I don't want to see your friends shackled like prisoners, I have no reason to believe that they'll now help a country they have terrorized for so long. They're harmless, I insist. They have no reason to fight against the Republic. Three death row prisoners just escaped, and then snaps. The colonies have launched a surprise attack on our capital. And now my would-be assassins are sitting a dozen yards away from me. I'm not in the most forgiving mood. I'm trying to help you, I fire back. You just caught your traitors, anyway, didn't you? Do you think the Patriots had anything to do with Commander Jameson's escape? Especially when she threw them to the dogs? Do you think I like the idea that my mother's killers are on the loose now? Unleash the Patriots, and they'll fight for you. And it narrows his eyes. What makes you think they're so loyal to the Republic? Let me lead them, I say. Eden jerks his head up at me in surprise. And you'll get your loyalty. June shoots me a warning glance. I take a deep breath, sh sh swallow my frustration and will myself to calm down. She's right. No point getting angry at Andon if you need him on my side, if I need him on my side. Please, I had in a lower voice. Let me help. You have to trust someone. Don't just leave people out there to die. Andon studies my face for a long moment, and with a chill, I realize how much he looks like his father. The similarity is only there for an instant, though, and then it vanishes, replaced by Andon's serious, concerned gaze, as if he suddenly remembers who we are. He sighs deeply and tightens his lips. Let me know what your plan is, he finally says, and we'll see. In the meantime, I suggest you get your brother on a subway. When he sees my expression, he adds, he'll be safe until you join him. You have my word. Then he turns away and motions for June to accompany him. I let my breath out as I watch a soldier lead him and June toward the cluster of generals. June looks over her shoulder at me as, she, as they go. I know she's thinking the same thing I am. She's worried about what this war is doing to Andon, what it's doing to all of us. 
Lucy interrupts my thoughts. Perhaps we should get your brother on the evacuation train, she says. She gives me a sympathetic look. Right. I look down at Eden and pat his shoulder. I try my best to have faith in the lecture's promise. Let's head over to the train and get details on how, how to get you out of here. What about you? Eden says. Are you really going to lead some kind of assault? I'll meet up with you in Los Angeles, I swear. Eden doesn't make a sound as we make our way over the train platform and let the soldiers escort us toward the front. His expression has grown serious and sullen. When we're finally in front of the train's closed glass door, I bend to his eye level. Look, I'm sorry I'm not going to be with you right away. I need to stay here and help, yeah? Lucy's got you. She'll keep you safe. I'll join up with you soon. Yeah, fine. Eden grumbles. Oh, I clear my throat. Eden is sickly and tech-minded and occasionally obnoxious, but he's rarely angry like this. Even after his blindness, he stayed optimistic. So his bluntness throws me off. Well, that's good. I decide to respond. I'm glad you're, you're hiding something from me, Daniel. He interrupts. I can tell. What is it? I pause. No, I'm not. You're a terrible liar. Eden pulls himself out of my grasp and frowns. Something's up. I could hear it in the elector's voice. And then you said that weird thing to me the other day about how you were afraid the Republic soldiers would come knocking on our door. Why would they do that all of a sudden? I thought everything was fine now. I sigh and bow my head. Eden's eyes soften a little, but his jaw stays firm. What is it? He repeats. He's 11 years old. He deserves to know the truth. The Republic wants you back for experimentation, I reply, keeping my voice low so that only he can hear me. There's a virus spreading in the colonies. They think you have the antidote in your blood. They want to take you to the labs. Eden stares in my direction for a long, silent moment. Above us, another dull thud shakes the earth. I wonder how well the armor's holding up. Seconds drag by. Finally, I put my hand on his arm. I won't let them take you away, I say, trying to reassure him. Okay, you're going to be fine. Andon, the, the elector, knows that he can't take you away without risking a revolution among the people. He can't do it without my permission. All those people in the colonies are going to die, aren't they? Eden mutters under his breath. The ones with the virus? I hesitate. I never asked much about exactly what the plague symptoms were. I stopped listening the instant they mentioned to my brother. I don't know, I confess. And then they're going to spread it to the Republic. Eden turns his head down and brings his hands together. Maybe they're spreading it right now. If they take over the capital, the disease will spread, won't it? I don't know, I repeat. Eden's eyes search my face. Even though he's nearly blind, I can see the unhappiness in them. You don't have to make all my decisions, you know. I didn't think I was. Don't you want to evacuate to LA? It's safer there, and I told you, I'll catch up with you there, I promise. No, not that. Why'd you decide to keep this a secret? This is why he's upset? You're kidding, right? Why? Eden presses. You would have agreed? I move closer to him, then glance around at the soldiers and evacuees and lower my voice. I know I declared my support for Andin, but that doesn't mean I've forgotten what the Republic did to our family. To you. When I watched you get sick, when the plague patrols came to our door and dragged you out on the gurney with blood blackening your eyes? I pause close my eyes and shut the scene down. I've played it in my head a million times. No need to revisit it again. The memory makes the, pla the pain flare up in the back of my head. Don't you think I know that? Ed fires back in a low, defiant voice. You're my brother, not our mom. I narrow my eyes. I am now. No, you're not. Mom's dead. Eden takes a deep breath. I remember what the Republic did to us. Of course they do. But the colonies are invading. I want to help. I can't believe Eden's telling me this. He doesn't understand the length the Republic will go. Has he really forgotten their experiments? I lean forward and put my hand on his tiny wrist. It could kill you. Do you realize that? And they might not even find a cure using your blood. Eden pulls away from me again. It's my decision to make, not yours. His words echo June's from earlier. Fine, I snap. Then what's your decision, kid? He steals himself. Maybe I want to help. You've got to be kidding me. You want to help them out? Are you just doing this to go against what I'm saying? I'm serious. A lump rises in my throat. Eden, I begin. We've lost mom and John. 
Dad is gone. You're all I have left. I can't afford to lose you too. Everything I've done so far, I've done for you. I'm not letting you risk your life to save the Republic or the colonies. The defiance fades from Eden's eyes. He props his arms up on the railing and leans his head back against his hands. If there's one thing I know about you, he says, is that you're not selfish. I pause. Selfish. I am selfish. I want Eden to stay protected, out of harm's way, and screw whatever he thinks about that. But at his words, my guilt bubbles up. How many times had John tried to keep me out of trouble? How many times had he warned me against messing with the Republic or trying to find a cure for Eden? I'd never listened, and I don't regret it. Eden stares at me with sightless eyes, this ability the Republic handed to him. And now he's offering himself up, a sacrificial lamb to the slaughter, and I can't understand why. No, I do understand. He is me. He's doing what I would have done. But the thought of losing him is too much to bear. I put my hand on his shoulder and start steering him inside. Get to LA first. We'll talk about this later. You better think this through because if you volunteer for this, I did think this through, Ian replies. And he pulls out of my grasp and steps back through the balcony door. And besides, if they came for me, do you really think we could stop them? And then his turn comes. Lucy helps him step into the subway and I hold his hand for a brief moment before he has to let go. Despite how upset he seems to be, Eden still clutches my hand hard. Hurry up, okay? He says to me. Without warning, he throws his arms around my neck. Beside him, Lucy gives me one of her reassuring smiles. Don't you worry, Daniel, she says. I'll watch him like a hawk. I nod gratefully to her. Then I hug Eden tight, squeeze my eyes shut, and take a deep breath. See you soon, kid, I whisper. Then I reluctantly entangle my fingers, his fingers from mine. Eden disappears into the subway. Moments later, the train pulls away from the station and takes the first wave of evacuees toward the Republic's west coast, leaving only Eden's words behind ringing in my mind. Maybe I want to help. I sit alone for some time after his train leaves, lost in thought, going over all those words repeatedly. I'm his guardian now. I have every right to keep him from harm. And hell if I'm going to see him back in the Republic's labs after everything I've done to keep him from there. I close my eyes and bury my hands in my hair. After a while, I make my way back to the room where the Patriots are being kept. The, the doors open. When I step inside, Pascal quits stretching out his arms and Tess looks over from where she's finishing the bandaging of the wounded girl's sh shoulder. So, I say to them, my eyes linger on Tess. You guys came back to town to give the colony some hell? Tess drops her gaze. Pascal shrugs. Well, it won't matter if no one lets us back up there. Why? You have something in mind? The lecture's given his permission, I reply. As long as I'm in charge. He thinks we'll be good enough not to turn against the Republic. What a stupid fear anyway. They still have my brother, don't they? A slow smile spreads across Pascal's face. Well, that sounds like it could be fun. What do you have in mind? I put my hands in my pockets and put my arrogant mask back on. What I've always been good at. And that's where we'll stop for today. <laughs> so we'll see what they end up doing tomorrow. All right, so I will see you guys tomorrow. Tomorrow, it's, um, the reading's going to be just a little bit earlier. It's going to be at 9.30, just because I have a, a doctor's appointment I have to go to at 11.30, so I want to make sure I can get there in time. Um, so I'll see you guys tomorrow, 9.30, for the next chapter. All right, bye.